at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis for a Regis Dialogue with Claire Denis. Tonight's program is called Claire Denis, Unpredictable Universe, and we'll talk with Claire about her remarkable career as a film director. From her first film, Chocolat, to her latest, White Material, Denis has explored the human costs and political perversions of colonialism, inhabiting African landscapes with both a physical intimacy and psychic estrangement. In films like Nanette and Boni and 35 Shots of Rum, she approaches the domestic sphere with an equal degree of mystery and expansiveness, approaching the everyday with curiosity, sensuality, and rigorous humanity. And with her masterpieces Beau Travail and The Intruder, Denis pursued abstracted narratives of seductive tactility. They pulse and breathe and invite the viewer to inhabit them as much as see them. She shoots for that sweet spot where film form contemplates consciousness, where the advancing present instantly retreats to a remembered past, and where what's literal overlaps with what's imagined. I'm Eric Hines, a New York-based writer and critic. Now we'll begin our Regis Dialogue with Claire Denis. Hello, everybody. So I think we're actually going to start with a clip to begin things. So it's actually the first sequence of Claire's first film, Chocolat. Vous allez le doigt là. Il n'y a pas de départ avant une heure. C'est trop con ça. Montez, moi aussi je vais à doigt là. Bimba. Bimba. Miso. Niso. Miso. Niso. Matoy. Matoy. Nyo. Nyo. Lopo. Lopo. Bombo. 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 Ah. Moti di moya o mona. Comment tu t'appelles? France. France. We love France. <laughs> well, before I even start then, I mean, uh, do you feel a connection to the filmmaker still who made that? Yes and, and no, because um, me, I'm not the same, of course, and this country, Cameroon, is not the same either. It, we, I will certainly not feel at that easy nowadays um, and the only thing that makes me feel it's me it's uh, to see Isaac's face because I've been working with him since and to see Isaac uh, 24 years ago I mean it's really it's good <laughs> Well, I mean, he's, he's gorgeous, so I mean... <laughs> no, he's gorgeous, but it's also good to... S um, I don't know. In, 
in that film some people are dead now, you know. And Isaac is, uh, I know him, I still work with him, so it's a sort of continuation of something that reminds me that I was there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, the, my first prepared question, then, because of that clip, was um, if you could talk to us a little bit about how much of your childhood and your life made its way into the character of Franz. I mean, I know that it's somewhat based on your own life, but at the same time, I know that it's it's a it's a fictional creation. And when you look back on it, do you think of your own life or do you think of the film? Mm, I think a character like that is not completely fiction, even the white parents, because it's thing I remembered, not only from my own childhood, but from uh, the context of my childhood. It was not through melancholy that I wanted to go back to those years. It was as um, I thought, if I make a film, the first film, I should do it um, to market that um, I am who I am because I grew there. So that was important for me. And the second thing maybe is that I didn't want to make a film with um, a sort of uh, message that colonization was terrible or whatever. I just wanted to speak about this character of Isaac is interpreting of someone who has not a bad life but is uh, in a situation where he is permanently humiliated by nice people, people who want, will never want to harm him, you know, just the situation is like that. So, but the child itself, in my, herself, as I remember while writing the script, she was not uh, existing really. She was like the, the thread for, for the flashback and um, while we were writing the script, she, she was like a bore. I thought, oh my God, I will have to direct her. <laughs> to find a kid and, and, you know, and then it was easy in the end, but it was not so, it was, I thought it was going to be much more difficult. Was there, was there an aspect of something about the uh, character that Isaac uh, is playing, something about that figure that was unresolved for you, that you wanted to go back and actually look at, at, at the character of, of I mean, did you know people that way that, that you sense that as an adult you actually were ready to start interrogating what, those, what that life was like? No, but if I was looking, it was not like an in, remembering or watching family uh, still photographs, you know, of my childhood with my family. There was always the boy there or the gardener or the cook, you know, and they had name that we remember because uh, children were at ease with us. They were young men normally, you know, and we were probably more at ease with them than our parents. And I think also there was a a book, a famous book, written by a Cameronese writer who was dead now long ago. He, he, he started as a boy and he wrote, uh, his first book is called uh, a Life, The Life of a Boy. And I remember reading that when I was a teenage and suddenly um, reinterpreting a sort of guiltiness I had since I was very small. Not a guiltiness, let's say, 
it was, guiltiness is maybe too strong a word, but a vague feeling of um, when a plate was presented to me, um, I knew that when I was back to see my grandparents, no one was washing the dish but my grandmother or, you know, mm -hmm. things like that suddenly were so strange that when I was going back to where we were supposed to live in Africa, whether it was in Cameroon or it Burkina Faso, we were living like uh, in the 19th century. That was very weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even when you said the sort of life of a boy is the memoir, that it's referring to the fact that they're actually yeah, called boys. They're not. In fact, in that book, the the boy um, still has stolen something. I guess in the end, he's dying. It's a very tragical story, but it starts on by being humiliated. Um, it, it takes place in the 40s, I guess, you know. When you go back to Africa now, do you feel that it's home or do you feel like a tourist, sort of, the way that France answers that question? I don't feel like a tourist, but I must say that I, I never felt like a tourist nowhere. Um, I don't know, I'm too curious maybe even if I go a place I'd never been before, I, I don't want to look like a tourist. I don't want to feel like a tourist. Maybe I look like a tourist, but I don't want to feel like a tourist. And of course, I'm not like France, uh, but, but I think uh, it's not home. It's a place that I known at different period and it's um, that it has connection with me physically because the smell or the food or all the thing that comes back from childhood even some schools i remember and still exist some ha some houses um, and a feeling of that um, that quality of heat that I always feel good with, but that's, it's not home. It was never home. I was. We were raised by um, reasonable people. We were never raised as if it was home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, thanks God. No, I mean, we, we had uh, not the... Uh, we were not raised with brutality. We were raised trying to be... seeing things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read uh, uh, a bit of dialogue from uh, towards the end of Chocolat to talk about. Uh, it's what the father is talking to France, um, who's a, a diplomat. Is that correct to say? Or no, in in the film is is like an administrator, which is a civil officer. Civil officer, okay. Mm. So it, it's it's not at all as um, there is a big difference with diplomat. Number one, in the time of colonial, there was no diplomat because. Um, there was no <laughs> diplomacy to be made, you sure. know. <laughs> and Very also, true. civil. My father was a young man. As a civil officer, he was like a low. Uh, he, he was not an important person, so he was sent into the bush, you know, on small places. Okay. And it was not grand, you know. It was like. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> so he says, um, and if this of course refers to the first thing we see in the film, when you look at the hills beyond the houses and beyond the trees, where the earth touches the sky, that's the horizon. Tomorrow in the daytime, I'll show you something. The closer you get to that line, the farther it moves. If you walk towards it, it moves away. It flees from you. I must explain this to you. 
You see the line, you see it, but it doesn't exist. And it seems to me that horizons keep coming back in your films. Do you feel like you're still actually chasing that horizon? I am ashamed of those lines. Oh, really? I wish, I wish they were not existing. <laughs> I think one day I, I felt like writing a sort of interesting piece of dialogue. And I honestly think it's really bullshit. <laughs> No, I have to say. No, no, it's good. But, but, uh, but, but in a sense, you're doing something in dialogue. But I think but you're it's because I wanted so much to look like a sort of intellectual who, <laughs> who could say, or um, a father speaking to. My father never told he me wouldn't things tell you like about the that. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> and I well, don't so know why I kept that. I think I kept it because. I think the day we were shooting, I wanted to cut it. I was so ashamed. Even at the time you were ashamed of it? When shooting, yes, I realized it was stupid. And, but the actor, <laughs> the actor had learned the line and he said, no, please don't cut those lines. I, I love them, you know. But you could have left it out when you edited. But then I would have, it would have been a sort of cheat, cheating him, you know. So I kept it, but it's... I could not. But nevertheless, I still think it's interesting that, yeah. in a sense, what he's saying explicitly is yeah. something that is implicit, I yeah. feel, in a lot of the films after that. Or at least visually, in the yeah. sense of... Maybe. But I don't understand very well the meaning of I think it's, it's sort of a stupidly poetic and right. whatever, you right. know. I never... The horizon line never bothered me uh, mm. really much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Except when, when but it's the first shot I'm of your lost film. in the sea, you know, and I'm afraid <laughs> to drown, but no. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. The first shot is, is it's a sea with a sort of gray horizon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that there is one thing I remember. This is true and it's something, if I had enough money, I would have started the film like that. I remember when I was a kid, usually my father would go before us by plane and the family will follow in on the boat because we have all this stuff, you know, the, the dishes, the, you know, the pillow, the clothes, everything, towels. And all this stuff you couldn't take into a plane, you know? So we, we were in that boat. And I always remember uh, when, you, when the boat get to Guinea Gulf near, um, near Cameroon, where, where it's close to the equator, the, the coastline is dark green because it's um, it's um, not sand or desert or mountain. It's flat and forest. And I, I remember that line because it's almost um, you you it, it, it's so dark and it's like a wall. You know, it's it's nothing. You you feel you can't penetrate. You know. It's really impressive the first time, even second time. This I remember, but it's not the horizon. It, it's the the a vision of um, if I think today of the Portuguese who were the first to get into Cameroon, because Cameroon means uh, shrimp in Portuguese, big shrimp, mm. and there were big shrimp there. Um, I, I, I think that they were brave to approach this dark coast yeah. mm -hmm. because it's, um, it's, it's a little bit, um, I don't know, it's not uh, 
charming, you know, it's, um, it's terrifying in a way. Mm. Well, with that, I think we're going to move on to another clip. I think I could spend the entire time talking about chocolat with you. Um, but uh, this is the one moment we're going to sort of break out of chronology and actually go to the most recent film that was released, White Material. Um, and uh, sort of look at that in, in conjunction with Chocolat. It's good Maria is not speaking about the Horizon line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm briefly going to read from Chocolat again. Hopefully it's not as embarrassing to you. Um, but there's a short scene in Chocolat where um, the father again, almost offhandedly says, one day we'll get kicked out of here. Yeah. And it's interesting to sort of think of white material in that light because in a sense, yeah. 
we were visiting a, a, a white family in Africa, and now is the time that they actually are getting kicked out of here. Yeah. Um, of course, he, 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 he speaks uh, like a civil officer. He speaks about uh, a change in politics. The, the, um, the character of Maria in that film is completely different because she's, um, she believes she owns this land where she grows coffee. And she believed she's entitled to stay. And that she believes also she's protected, not because she is rich, because she's not, but because she thinks being white made her um, sort of, um, it's like a shield, you know, against, uh, and when this moment of civil war starts, she knows it, she's not completely blind, but she thinks that if she's strong enough, she will stay and nothing will happen to her. Although, she, I probably think she, she's afraid somehow. Mm -hmm. She knows it's, everything is fake in her judgment. But she had no other place to go, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, she says I would understand her. She says something else at some point where she says, um, well, you know, she's asked, why don't you just go back to Paris? And she goes, I can't be brave in Paris. I can't be brave in France. It's, this is where she can, this yeah, personality can show itself. It, it's true. I remember us or people I know, for instance, like, let's say, while we were shooting, we were staying in a place sort of hotel um, that a French guy built um, and there was no other place to go anyway and he made it in a sort of uh, funky way uh, like a safari style you know a little bit ridiculous and we were staying there and we were more than happy to have that place and he was not such a young man. His wife uh, wanted to go back to France, but they had nothing. They, in, with this hotel, they had a style, they had a, a car, they had, they, they had a lot of things they know they won't have going back to France. Mm -hmm. So it's the kind of thing she knows. I, there was a moment when we were writing the script. I want her, the, the last part of the film to be her alone in France. And working in a, let's say, a Walmart or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. hmm. And she knows that. Mm -hmm. Because there is a potential of being... To be white makes you slightly above the everyday problem, and it's not true. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is really interesting, watching that clip after Chocolat, is think, looking at the sort of the way that you establish point of view in Chocolat, to sort of see the way that France is directly pan right to her, and then we cut away um, back and forth, her sort of looking at the young man and, and, and his son and appreciating the beauty of their skin on the beach. But then to see white material and to see in some ways things turned around and see the white skin being fetishized and the white material being fondled. Is there, is there a power associated with that? Is there a power to be able to, to, to observe um, the opposite race in that way? Is there anything that, about that that's being negotiated? Mm, I wouldn't say that unless it would be a sort of... A if I was like uh, believing in doing a, a voodoo scene or something, you know, in that case, they just um, enter the, this house and stole a gun 
I mean, the the kids, the chil children, and suddenly this bigger child uh, is following them and is a. Uh, I don't know. I think they exa exaggerate a little bit um, what they're doing, as if it was a sort of, um, as if he was almost a disgusting uh, thing, you know that is. The little boy smell his hair, and and they call him yellow dog. But I think it's a sort of a game just to show him they're stronger because they have a gun. And, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think it has. It's not a very pretentious scene. To too too metaphoric. Mm -hmm. I I hope. <laughs> um. Something related to that, you, you had told a colleague of mine, Adam Naiman, in an interview um, uh, of, of your work, you said, in, every image is about subjectivity. And I would love to sort of talk to you about that a little bit, especially, especially in, sort of in relation to what we've, what we've seen, because you said it's not so metaphoric, and I think that's actually true, because we're always inside somebody's point of view, we're always experiencing something. You're not something showing us a symbolic image. You're showing us what somebody is actually experiencing. So for in, in, in relation to your filming, how is it how is every image about subjectivity? How does it work? For me there is no other way to to plan a film if it's not so to speak to I have point of view when I make a film. No. But it's hardly impossible to shoot a film, a scene, uh, in an emotional way, or for me to feel the scene, if if I have not chosen before which point of view it is. Mm. Even if it's mine, in the end, it has to go through one character. Otherwise, I I feel nothing, you know. And why not make a master shot and close up of this and that? If I feel like this is the point of view of someone, then I, I know I don't need that shot. Maybe I can see only a sequence shot, for instance. It, it's really necessary for me, filming. Not with a point of view of me about life and the world and the way it goes and blah, 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 but about the character mm -hmm. of, of the film. Mm -hmm. This scene starts with, with this uh, white, uh, almost young man running after those two kids for fun. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, the situation uh, turned against him. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it's ironic and, and dangerous about it, though, too. Is there a yeah, sense Yeah, because of, it's two different points of view. And the other point of view is there's a degree of fun on yeah. the other, sense, the other mm -hmm. side, too. Mm -hmm. They're having fun mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah. Um, and the third point of view is probably if you go, we go on with the scene would be Maria, the mother, who discover a son naked. She doesn't know why, but she sort of guess it's time to go mm -hmm. because of that, you know? So it's a, another point of view mm -hmm. of the nakedness mm -hmm. from a distance. Right, right, the last shot is her mm -hmm. observing him. There's, there's something just incredibly, at least to my eyes, effortless about that shifting of point of view. I think that that's, a lot of filmmakers spend their entire careers trying to somehow establish those many, that many different points of view within the same sequence like that. And it just seems to be, come, I don't want to say it's natural because it's probably a lot of hard work, but it does seem to sort of come off as this, this is simply the way that you see the world. This is the way that you create scenes. <clears throat> Some films I feel they could not, I, could, I can't shift in a, in a scene or even in a continuity, I have to keep solidly to only one character's point of view. It has to be told like that. 
some film like uh, White Material, um, it's mostly Maria's, but because she doesn't want to see, somehow there are other point of view. Mm -hmm. When I think it, it dramatically in that film, it really does make sense that there's a lot of different characters coming from a lot of different places, mm -hmm. and every, nobody's settled, nobody has an idea of exactly where things are going, but they all have a different point of view, and you certainly honor mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit to another clip. and the, the, When oh, sorry, we start writing the script, no, oh, the, even before the first scene I had in mind, because without one scene I cannot go working on a script. It was the point of view of a French soldier in a helicopter mm. watching a small white woman among trees, coffee trees or whatever, and a farmer, and uh, he yelled at her and says, that, that's your last chance. Come with us, you might be killed. We. Um, French army is leaving the country, so it's your last chance. And she's doing this. Mm -hmm. it, it was, in fact, the point of view of the soldier. Mm -hmm. First vision of Maria. Mm -hmm. And it, it was very helping to write the script. Mm -hmm. To watch her small mm -hmm. and fragile. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're going to, if you don't mind, we're going to switch double back now to a little bit earlier film um, to talk about um, as, as uh, well as you sort of visit this, this area of the world, you're also sort of I mean, very adept at, at domestic scenarios as well and uh, at, at urban life. So we're going to go watch a clip from Ninet and Bunny. And um, uh, for those who haven't seen the film, uh, it's about two estranged siblings who are uh, brought back into each other's lives. And um, Ninette is pregnant and Bunny is a restless and sexually frustrated young man. Um, he works in a pizza truck, and this is a scene where he uh, is preparing the dough.
I don't think nearly enough people talk about how funny your films can be. <laughs> um, uh, and it, not only funny, but it, speaking of point of view, I think it's so wonderful how we're not given the point of view to make fun of him or to look at him head on. We're actually, we're needing the dough along with him. Uh, why was that so, I mean, obviously that was. Yeah, this <clears throat> two young actors, Grégoire and Alice, the, I had worked once with them before and I really liked them so much as brother and sister, so I wanted to do another film, brother and sister, but in a, in a sort of tragedy because she she's pregnant and it's too late and she has to keep the baby and he doesn't want her to stay around but then he realized he's uh, the only one that could take care of, of her. And for me, every single scene in the film uh, was, I was physically involved with both of them. So I think it's... What, it's, does, that, what does that mean, physically involved with both of them? I, I felt them so... They were like my, not like my children, but they were like part of me, both of them. And, and now, now they, of course they grow up, but, and, but they're still part of me. Mm. I, I really like uh, actors like, I like Grégoire and Alice. Because they, they, they were young people with a lot of trust. And Grégoire was not afraid. It's not an easy scene to do the dough in one take, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he did it just like that. So it, it means trust. Mm -hmm. Maybe also it's funny. It's true that I think Grégoire is, is funny. But the, he, ooh, the ooh sound is particularly good. Yeah. The high pitched ooh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grégoire is great. But I think also he's great because he, we trust each other and it feels really good, you know, yeah, working with um, those two kids. They, they were kids. Um, having dreams of their own and being acting for the film. I mean, Alice was six, 15, 15, yeah. Mm. So uh, I think in that case, it's a loving point of view. I, I don't know, it was, I was in the, the, the film is in the middle of their relation, I think. Mm. Their relation is, is simply that they, they do realize that in fact they need each other and they love each other, although they don't know mm -hmm. because they were separated. Mm -hmm. So little by little they, they admit they, they love each other, you know. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about the film is that um, so much of what we see is uh, Bonnie's desires being played out, either him, in this sense, you see physically how the, what the manifestation of his desire, but you also see dream sequences and him sort of having these romantic notions of, of, of people he desires, the lives that they could have. But at the same time, we're allowed to desire him too. It's not so much that uh, you know, we are subjected to his fantasies. We, we, in a sense, he's a part of ours. Yes, I think he has this sort of grace as an actor to be um, intelligent enough to, in a way, offer himself, you know? He's, he's not... Uh, <laughs> Grégoire never tried as an actor to show that he understands the scene and what it means in the film and blah, blah, blah. He, he's like... A, Someone would dive in the scene and swim, you know. I, I like that. 
uh, he's in a number of your films during this time, and it was, was in 35 Shots of Rum just a few years ago as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, would it be fair to call Grégoire and, and Isaac and several other reactors, are they, are they muses at all? Are you responding to them and feeding off of them as much as you're directing them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Most of the actor I work with, I think, um, I don't know, it's a, a link that um, is unbreakable, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it's such a secret way of uh, trusting each other, of um, showing um, what we are made of, you know? Making a film, you show a lot of yourself, you know, not only as an actor, also as a director. So that link and that trust is uh, something that never stops. Mm -hmm. For me, that's why I work again and again with the same actors and actresses, because otherwise um, I'm... I'm missing them. Mm -hmm. now, I've, I've heard that from other filmmakers, that how uh, the intent, the, such an intense experience to work on a film that uh, to then all of a sudden walk away and barely see each other is, it's a, it's a very traumatic experience. So I would imagine the opportunity to keep going back to those people must be hard to pass It's out. sad with the crew, mm -hmm. but the crew is, we know they go to work with another film, but with actors and actresses, it's always different because, not like the dough, but I touch them, I choose their clothes, I choose the way they speak, I, they're, they're like mine, you know, <laughs> and I hate when they work on other films, <laughs> even after all those years, you know. Yeah. When Grégoire is in a film, I, uh, I, think, he's, I think he's badly, he's badly lit. That is, he's, he's not like that. He's much better than that. You know, it, it's and not only Grégoire, Beatrice Dal, uh, Vincent Gallo, it, it, all of them, they, they are, they are mine. <laughs> Well, those of us who love your films, I think, feel pretty much the same way. It's very strange to see them in different films. But it's crazy, you know. I know it's crazy. <laughs> they are not mine. <laughs> but um, how could I say that? Of course, I know they are not mine. But I cannot believe in them if they are, don't belong a little bit, you know. I need to possess them a little bit. <laughs> well, in a sense, I think you allow you allow us to possess them too, which is a it's a yeah. amazing thing. Even even Isabelle Huppert, I knew her for years, but never worked with her. And everyone said, "Oh, you're working with Isabelle. She's a." Pff. But Isabelle <laughs> was like a, a toy. I, I was always touching her hair. To, you know, I, I mean, I wanted. Um, I, I told her maybe I, I will take you home. You know, but it's true. She was mine. She was not Isabelle Huppert. Well, it says a lot about her then, somebody that established and and And, and she's well not afraid to be old. That's the thing. No, 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 no. she likes. Well, anybody who's allowed themselves to work with Michael Haneke the way that she had, obviously she's okay, she's okay being owned a little bit. Um, uh, she's brave. She's very brave, very, very brave. Um, well, let's move on to another film that's Rose Grégoire. Um, we've gone to uh, Cameroon and to Paris, and let's move on to Djibouti and the French Foreign Legion for Beau Travail.
C'était un plateau aride qui se terminait en terrasse. Des vestiges de baraquements construits pour des ouvriers. C'est dans cet espace désolé que nous nous sommes installés. Et trois volcans montaient la garde. Sentinelle. À mon commandement, relevez Par là Je dis, ouais, tout ça Il faut pas de l'eau Rien de l'eau, vas-y Cogne Cogne, là I find it almost impossible to watch just a part of that film. I kind of want to sit here and watch the whole. I don't like to watch the image normally, but Djibouti is such a strange, very, not magic, but it, 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 it creates something so weird. It's like a total desert of soul and lava, or salt and lava. And this Red Sea is very blue, but also full of sharks, so nothing is... Mm. Uh, the wind is blowing, and this wind is uh, full of sand and very hot. So nothing is nice, and yet, I don't know why, uh, it's a place where actually the real foreign legend do train because the physical conditions are extremely difficult mm -hmm. and yet as we were shooting maybe we were suffering from this heat and this dryness and this wind and it was uh, like uh, blowing us away you know and When we were rehearsing, I never told the actors that I had in mind to use uh, Benjamin Britten music, uh, Billy Budd, mm -hmm. that we had been listening while writing the script. So I, pay, I, play, the, I play back the music while shooting. But the wind was blowing so strong, they couldn't hear very well. So they, they heard a sort of music in the wind, you know. Mm. This is the mixed films, you know. But, and 
suddenly everything became like uh, all their gesture became so solemn and I don't know like uh, the beginning of the world or something like that you know <laughs> but it's the that part of the world is really strikingly strong. Mm. Well, it does it seem that whatever shot you choose, whatever sort of part of the landscape you choose seems wildly different than the last one, in a sense. But if, if, if you're looking just at the soil or if you're looking at the ocean, whatever, it just seems very diverse, actually. Yeah. No? Diverse in what sense? Well, in the sense that there's the, sort of, there's the, there's the, the salt beach. Yeah. You know, there is, there's mountains. <laughs> I can say something I felt as a, as a child I was there, so I came back for the mm. film, but there is something I, I, I remember is uh, we were not allowed to leave the city without giving our name because many people died in the desert, you know. Mm -hmm. So even going to school was um, with protection because of the sun, et cetera, et cetera. But why we were shooting, I remember, it's a place where maybe you feel strong. We all felt strong because it looks in a dream like maybe the earth could be at the very beginning mm. or could be at the very end. No more meant for life. There is no grass, mm -hmm. no trees, you know. Mm -hmm. So it gives a feeling of um, maybe um, it's not morbid. It, it's it's not you don't feel, but you feel a sort of um, you on earth by chance. Maybe it won't last, you know. Mm -hmm. It's very strange. You had mentioned the, uh, the opera by Benjamin Britten, B Billy Budd, but the, in a sense the, the story is also inspired by Herman Melville's Billy Budd. Yeah. This is the f first of, of, a, of several f films of yours that were at least somewhat loosely based on texts that existed. Yeah. Was, was that, if you could talk a little bit about that sort of decision to sort of, in, in your, was, that some, was that somehow freeing to you in terms of style and narrative to be able to sort of jump off from a pre-existing work? It's something that, that this film, I was offered to do a film and the French TV who produced that film told me um, the, the, can you make a story that we want to make films about what it is to be a foreigner, what it is to feel foreign with the quote, a quote of Deleuze to make it very serious and <laughs> please not use as a main character uh, a, doc a doctor or a journalist because we have too much of those films <laughs> already. So I actually felt Foreign, foreign, and then I found foreign legend, and then I realized I knew Djibouti, and it. But then I had no, nothing to say about the foreign legend. I knew nothing. And then I, I was reading um, poetry, not Billy Bird. Billy Bird I had read before, uh, poetry by uh, Herman Melville, and one poem is called I think the Night March. And it's a lost battalion of soldiers, lost in the night without their commandant or captain or whatever, without a, a, command, a commanding, you know. And they are lost in the night and they don't know where they're going. The only thing they can see is the moon reflecting on the metallic a piece of their guns. Mm. And this poem was so strong and frightening because it, 
Those guys were men in arms, lost in the night, looking for their captain, you know. And they were like uh, children lost in a forest, you know. And that, this poem started all like... Um, and then Billy Bud came after, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's not to support the story, it's just to create this sort of uh, emotional state. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could be a music, you know, mm -hmm. where I feel some things strong enough and I, co I can invent a sort of narration. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I won't believe if, if I don't have that emotional state. I mean, it's not an emotional state. It's something that is not firm, is not um, from me. It's like an echo of something that wake me up to sensation. Mm -hmm. I was never a soldier, I was never a sailor, but suddenly, being lost, I understood. And how much um, comes together editing versus when you're filming a film like this? Is it, does it echo back to you once you actually look at this, the footage and, and, and does a different film come to you? This film, Bo Travail, uh, we shot only four weeks and not, we didn't have so many footage, so I think everything is, is in the film, you know. Mm -hmm. It was maybe editing with Benjamin Britten, Neil Young, and the nightclub songs. Yeah, it gives a sort of um, echo to the sound of the wind that... Th this wind is so noisy that even at night I could hear it, you know? Mm. And... No, I think it was... Editing was... Was also emotional. Mm. Yeah, it was... Uh, still fulfill with the, the emotion of the film coming through those actors and this country. And still remembering Night March. Mm -hmm. I still can feel it when I read that poem. It's very... Some text... Um, it's not that they are emotional, especially, but they have, um, or maybe they give me, they correspond with me in a way that I recognize something that I can describe in a film. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There is, we had no generator, so we had almost no night scenes. Mm -hmm. I don't have a night march in the film, <laughs> but the night march was there all the time. Okay. We were lost. Mm -hmm. As hard as it is to move on from Beaudrevai, uh, um, let's watch uh, a film, uh, a clip but that... It's not sad, I'm lost in a good way. Lost, uh... <laughs> no, right, in that sense, right. No, there's nothing sad about being lost in that sense. Um, a clip from The Intruder. Uh, uh, I think you, you mentioned uh, the importance of music for constructing Beautreville, and in this particular clip, music and sound is, is, is vital to what you're doing, so it'd be great to talk about that. Moi, j'aime bien celle-là. Alors, celle-ci, elle est beaucoup plus contemporaine. Elle a des aiguilles dauphines et puis des index obus qui nous permettent d'apposer le poinçon de Genève, ouais. qui est un label de qualité. Vous voyez la masse oscillante, qui est en or 21 carats. Et puis l'intérêt de cette montre, c'est de pouvoir apprécier la beauté du mouvement, qui est un calibre automatique 315. Mm -hmm. Voilà. Ouais, elle vous va bien. Oui. 
qui aurait payé. <rire> It's funny because, as you know, I don't know which clip. I didn't choose the clip. Did I do okay? No, so it's a surprise for me each time. <laughs> um, for, in a film where uh, dreams and reality are so thoroughly blurred, um, I think ma magnificently um, intertwined, um, in, in a sense, music and sound are the only clues you have, in a sense, to sort of be able to distinguish one sense of, of, of reality or you know, one, I, I, instead of calling it dreams versus reality, one possible reality from another. Um. Yes. Um, Stuart Staple uh, from Tindersticks was really very close in the editing room when we did the, the intro there. So <coughs> for the first time, he made this music on his own without the band. And he had a trumpet and he was looping the music on his own, you know? So we were like uh, working together, not him working with the band and me editing room. He was, he was with, with me in the editing room and, and the trumpet is something that came from the editing room in a way, like a sort of echo of a, uh, an instrument he had never used before, neither me. But this film, again, is, a, is blurred also for me, as you say, blurred, because it was completely um, naively innocent. I never thought I was blurring dream and 
memories and fear. It came just like that because of that book written by the philosopher, French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, about his heart transplant. And for instance, in that book, it's a very short text. He he said he described after, when he wake up after the heart transplant, the surgeon tell him, "Oh, it's so easy, you know, to change your heart. It's going to be difficult for you, but for us surgeon, it's it's like plumbing. It's nothing. It's uh, it, it it's not like." as refined as as a horlogerie, as a, a watch, you know, mm. which is. And it's written like that. And somehow everything came, came in the script in, in a way. And not only that, because if I may say a little bit more about this scene, it's shot in Geneva, where and Hotel Beau Séjour, where uh, Jean-Luc Godard uh, worked with Michel Subor mm. first time. And Michel Subor is... Uh, Who's the actor we see? He's the actor, the old guy. He was a very young actor. It was his first film. Running away from the French army to escape the Algerian war. Mm hiding in, 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 in Geneva and being then contacted by the extreme right wing of the French army who wanted to stay in, in Algeria. So it was also a little bit of the film by Jean-Luc Godard is called Le Petit Soldat. So there is just also a little bit of that also in the film, you know, like a, not a memory of the film, but a sort of connection with uh, Le Petit Soldat. It's all mixed together. So it's true, it's a blur. And for me, it was like, a, I, I thought I was like a dog sniffing where to go, you know? I was like, uh, I had never, it's a film I made with no doubt, or oh, usually I'm terrified. <laughs> this film I made <clears throat> with no doubt, the script, everything was simple. It's only when I was in Venice Film Festival with the film ready, and I saw the film and I said, oh my God, what I've done? <laughs> It's going to be a disaster. I'm, I'm going to be. So I left. <laughs> you left the festival. I was walking on the. Yeah, I was walking by the sea. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to, to drown. I, I have to kill myself. I've done something <laughs> I should never have done. It's, uh, it's terrible. Well, it's not. But you. Um, it's interesting. No, it was. Well, I mean, it's terrible. It, it, as if I don't feel like I'm a poet. I don't feel like I'm a musician. Somehow, this film came out like that with that shape. Absolutely, concretely, not poetically, and the blurring feeling came after. Um, I wanted to say that. Katerina Golubeva, this beautiful woman riding a horse, died last year. Mm. So I was happy to see her beauty again. Yeah. Mm. And she was in uh, uh, at least one other of your films, correct? Uh, I, I Can't, can't sleep. sleep, right. Yeah. And she is also in um, Leo Scarac's film, Polar X. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think we're, we have one more. And in 29 Palms. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Mm. Yeah. Very bold actress. Very bold. Mm. A bold human being also. Mm. Yeah.
I'm, I, I thought about that when I, I selected the clip. I was, I'm glad that you were happy to see her because it's also yeah. tough in many ways, I'm sure. Um, but in the, the, the notion of, of the degree to which Stuart Staples was involved in, in, in making this film, I mean, the music is such an important part of, of this and such an important, yeah. um, uh, it, it, in some ways, like the, the emotional rhythms that you're going on throughout the film are, are, are punctuated by, by the sort of theme throughout the film. Yeah. And I'm curious about, because um, this is sort of like the last place that I want to take this to and take it into the last clip, is, is, is that degree of collaboration. That I think that a lot of filmmakers um, have a real anxiety when it comes to working with um, composers and working with musicians. That they, it's, it's an aspect of the process where you could potentially give up control, because you're basically allowing another artist to create uh, you know, a, an important part of your film, but it seems like in in, certainly in your collaboration with, with Tindersticks and Stuart Staples, you're inviting that strong artistic presence. Yeah, I think um, I've been lucky because uh, when you, the music in Chocolat is uh, made by Abdullah Ibrahim and he was a very uh, impressive. He is a very impressive man, but for me, the music, um, I'm not afraid that someone might enter the film and I, I don't know. For me, the music is allowed and the musician is allowed to, to search with me. I don't know. And Stuart Staple from T the Sticks, it was completely, uh, it's a great luck that I have met that band and Stuart because <coughs> we had absolutely nothing in common, not the language, he can't speak French, my English is what it is. He has this northern accent, so when we met, I understand none of his words. And he understand none of my English. So we were like nodding to, nodding to each other in the editing room. <laughs> and so it creates a sort of... Um, um, we had to do it by hands, you know, not by long talks, you know. So when he did The Intruder, he was... Um, tired by touring with his band and it, he told me I'm sort of depressed I can try but on my own and I said okay let's try like that you know and he was he's really himself in the film I think mm. yeah mm. Um, let's just let's show this last clip and I'll set it up briefly it's um, from 35 shots of rum which is also involved, this clip also involves music to a, to a large degree and also a sense of, of community and, and from, to my eyes, a sense of um, collaboration between a filmmaker and, and actors. Briefly, it's about, a, a, to just talk about it in general, is a, 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 a sort of an extended modern family that uh, lives in an apartment building in Paris. And you have a, a father and a daughter and so their friends uh, that also live in that community that Clearly, there's some unresolved romantic notions um, or feelings there. Uh, they all pile into a car and, try and go to a concert, but the car breaks down along the way, and they're waylaid at a cafe after hours. And that's where we're at. Oui, Pierrot. Oui. Ah, c'est toi qui viens nous chercher Ouais, un problème de transmission, je pense. Ah oui, mais là, ça va faire trop tard. Laisse tomber, Gabriel. On n'est pas bien, là. Pierrot. Ouais, changement de programme, on reste. OK. Je sais pas si je vais pouvoir venir bosser lundi. Si bonnet. OK. Ouais, merci. 
Yo te quiero, yo me muero por tu amor. Si boné en tu boca la miel puso su dulzor. Ven aquí. Que te quiero y que todo tesoro eres tú para mí. Si boné, toi tu danses pas. <rire> Pourquoi tout le monde me regarde? À la rouille de tu palma, bien soin. Si no vienes, me moriré de amor. Si boné de mi sueño, te espero con ansia en mi cane. Si boné. Si no vienes, me moriré de amor. Hoy el eco de mi canto de cristal.
great song. <laughs> Such a good song. I mean, just because we're in front of a lot of people right now, I, I, that, I, the mysteries of cinema, that scene never fails to make me cry, and I don't know why. <laughs> Something just so perfect and gorgeous about it. That. Yeah, because it's also the moment where the film shifts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it's uh, during the night. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Of course, of course. <laughs> no, I, lo I love the song for sure, but it, it there was a purpose. For of that. course, of course. And and you said the, the 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 film shifts at that point. I mean, so much mm -hmm. happens. I mean, I can't imagine uh, more happening. The father happening uh, sees his daughter differently. Um, the father also wants to get rid of an, the neighbor who is in love with him and mm -hmm. he wants also to show his daughter that he is free also and the daughter doesn't know if, if she can... I mean, everyone is showing something... It's the moment where they really feel all those links are too heavy mm -hmm. and maybe it's time to move. Mm -hmm. To shift. <laughs> I mean, you described something that's also that's very complex and tangled, and yet what you show us is something that could not move any smoother. It it, it couldn't possibly. Mm. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, thanks to again to those actors and actresses, they, they, it, it's not possible if they were not able to understand the meaning of that, you know? Mm -hmm. They could say, well, what is this scene? You said it's the center of the film and there is not one line, you know? Mm -hmm. What is this? But they did believe in it, so mm -hmm. it became really like a sort of a night shift. Mm. On that note, I think we're ready for some questions. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, you have worked very often with Jean-Paul Fargo um, on the scripts. Can you say a little bit how that uh, collaboration um, started and how the working process is going on, kind of? Yeah, I met him before. Uh, while I was writing Chocolat, he's from Marseille, south of France, and he was a young playwright. And we enjoy working together first time, and then it's going on and on. Two exceptions, I think. Um, it's a good, he's a friend, and I think um, it's a collaboration that is not. Um, He's not a writer and me a filmmaker. We have the same interest in a lot of things. So it's fine. We, we can collaborate without um, the heavy, um, I don't know, burden of being working. Hello. Hi. Um, I, uh I had the privilege of watching a Beau Travail last night. It was a stunning film. Uh, uh, I just wasn't expecting anything like that. Um, the way I was trying to describe it to people afterwards, and I said it was like it was the most purely cinematic film I might have ever seen in my life, in that it's it hard to describe that it was, it was without dialogue, uh, just watching the scenes unfold. There was something magical about it. And, and, I, and, and the use of music was unlike anything I've, I've ever seen in a film as well. So my question for you is, as a filmmaker, and everything was so naturalistic at the same time, what, what is your background that you came to make a film like that? <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe... Um, watching film, uh, listening to music, reading poetry, I mean, the simple things in a way, you know, not learning, just, uh, I'm, I don't know, I, I let things um, 
come to me. Not that it's not, it's not easy to write a script, it's not easy to shoot a film, but it's um, important to let um, a belief grow. Therefore, there is less fear of abandon uh, oneself more, you know, not to be too much afraid, I think. I never think when I'm filming I am making author film. I, mm. I always believe I am just making a film. And then when it's finished and people say, oh, there is absolutely no dialogue, no, no psychology explanation. You say the film unfold, but it's the way I, f um, I watch my own life. I have no explanation really, you know. I feel like that. So my background is a uh, who I am, I'm not typically an intellectual, I'm not a poet, I'm not a musician. Maybe I'm a little bit of all this all together and cinema was um, the only thing that I really care for, actually. I don't mean it's so simple. I don't want to answer your question of, you know, it's so simple, I just do it like that. No. But I have a belief, I think. I believe that it will work. I don't know where it came from. It's interesting to, to hear you describe Botrovai this way and also when you describe the intruder as having mm. no, like, no anxiety. This is how you're going to. In some ways, th those two p films in particular. Yeah. It would. It almost you'd have to approach them that way to pull off what you pulled off. That if you actually were racked with anxiety and self doubt or, th or thought about it too much in that sort of self reflective way, you wouldn't necessarily be able to be as as, as cinematically bold as 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 people are responding I, to them. I, I would say for both those films. For many people, the narration is, is like uh, so elliptical, you know. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, it gave this way of telling a story makes me stronger, makes me involved deeply in the film because I know there are gap, gaps, ellipses, and I have to jump those uh, because there are often already in the script, you know. Mm -hmm. But it, it gives me a sort of um, enthusiastic uh, feeling about not explaining. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I always try when I work on a script, this time it finished, I'm going to go to a very uh, traditional narration like everybody else <laughs> and and I believe also in that and somehow there is a night shift. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. No, no. <laughs> I wake up in the morning, I said, no, no. <laughs> but I think a lot of people making films, uh, not only me, could feel that a film is, you have written a script, um, there is a sort of structure, a form, but the film by itself is unfolding. So there is also that reason inside making a film. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship with doubt. With doubt. Mm -hmm. yes. I've read and heard that doubt is uh, creative. Uh, me, I, 
I think it's uh, not my way to... I, I can... Doubt is really not um, helping me. What is helping me, it, it, it's a sort of anxiety that uh, concrete details that are not in schedule, anxiety that Katya might fall from the horse, anxiety that these little details like that, it creates a sort of a, um, general state of anxiety in me that is um, erasing the real doubt of is it going to be a film or nothing, you know? Because, of course, this doubt is always there. Uh, is there going to be a film in the end, you know? Who knows? I'm not sure. But if this doubt is every there on the set, then the crew could feel it, the actors could feel that doubt. So, I think um, I have found this way of uh, losing myself in a lot of uh, stress and anxiety that keep me away from the killing doubt, you know. It, it comes back in the editing room often. Then I wish I could die. But no, it's funny. Of course, it's a joke when I say that, but it's true also. There, there is dying moment in, in the editing room when nothing, everything falls apart. It's there, but I don't see. And suddenly, all the doubt I have push away from the beginning is coming back like a big tsunami and that's all I can say about doubt, you know. And then it's painful but it's the editing room and you, uh, I have to finish, you know. It's too late but it's, it's painful really. And it's good it does not happen before. So beyond being painful, do you think that at times it's helpful because it actually means that you're seeing multiple perspectives and possibilities as opposed to maybe when you have no doubt and no. so which might be kind of a blindness? No, I don't think so. I think um, I think the doubt is always there. The doubt is am I a filmmaker? Am I going to, is this film is going to be a film or not? Where, at what moment it will start to be a film and not images and sound, you know? Um, and while writing the script, while shooting, the, the, the film exists in, in a sort of, abstract way but with a shape and suddenly the doubt in the editing room is uh, enormous because the film doesn't show its, its face immediately in the editing room even though you edited the way you wanted there is something that is hidden like you have to, like um, in archaeology, to dig more, to find it. But this moment in between, it's, uh, it's a killing moment, really. I, I don't know if I answer you, your question. I think no. But I think you, you, you're asking something that I don't understand. Well, in, 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 in my mind, I think you approached uh, yeah. that question pretty well. Do you agree? <laughs> I do. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about how your collaboration with actors and um, how you direct them on the set. 
uh, specifically just in all of your films, the, the way they're shot, they're so physical and so sort of sensuous. And there's no sort of act, acting uh, going on. And I'm wondering what the process is for you to get to that, I guess. Um. You described a lot of hands-on Grégoire before. Yeah, I think it's an easy process because, number one, I like them, and I like to look at them. So uh, I would not consider that working with them is that just to film them in a scene, but it's to reveal more of them. And after a while, actor, actress, they feel that, you know, they feel that we are seeking with the way we film them for an inner beauty which is in them but is striking for me and I want this beauty, not a physical beauty, more than that, to be in the film. And it's easy for an actor or an actress to feel that look. Looking not for a scene, not for them acting, but for them to reveal something of what we are made of, you know? And uh, I think I trust that so much that in a way they do. And Agnès Godard was almost always doing camera with me, I think she feels the same. Yes. Thank you, Claire Denis. Thank you very much.